This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Hi, sorry about that little fussing about there of recording and not recording. Um, we'll start the conference, uh, the conference, the webinar um, uh, in a few minutes time. But just before we do, I thought it would be good to share uh, a little insight here from Sarah McMath, uh, who's the chief executive of Mosul, the market operator here in the UK. Um, uh, and as Sarah will tell you, her story around um, catching the virus and what it did to her. So I'm just going to press play and let her tell the story. Um, hopefully the sound is all going to work. Now that's not working, is it? No, the sound is not clear. Um, let's try that again. Uh, COVID virus. Um, so I, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the chief executive. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? That was a disaster. Let's give that another go. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Okay, so that clearly wasn't working. I do apologize. Um, I, I, I thought that was going to be better. Um, I so let's try that again. Uh, I will abandon that that, that, that that best laid plans of mice and men. Um, Charlotte, can you just confirm that you can hear me properly now and that we haven't got lots of nasty noise? It's all clear. Good. Um, so I'm, I apologize for that uh, slight challenge there. Um, what I had hoped to play you was just before we kicked off into the main webinar, uh, a little video of someone who had experienced the virus. And it was to act as a bit of a reminder as to why we're all here, because the story is horrific. And I've heard this story from four or five people who've had the virus. You catch it, it you feel terrible for a, a week or so, you then begin to feel better, and then you go down again and feel even worse. Um, and then you finally get to recover, but actually it takes six or seven or eight weeks before you're fully uh, back up to speed. Um, and that was going to be the story that Sarah McMath would have been able to share, um, but uh, it, yeah, technology uh, escaped me there, so apologies for that. What I'm now going to do is we will kick off, um, kick off properly. So this is the ninth of the weekly webinars summarizing what's been happening on the COVID-19 um, web uh, WhatsApp chat. Um, and we always start with this slide. It shows the number of people and organizations that are involved. We're pushing up to 600 now with about 350 organizations from all across the world uh, involved with this. And you can see on the map uh, how that, that spread is. We're still a little short on people from Russia. We've only got one Russian, but we're, we're gradually getting there. Um, with this many people on the group, we obviously have created some um, subgroups. Uh, so we've got yeah. the main group and then we've got 
four subgroups. Hello, yes, did someone say my name? Uh, hopefully you can still hear me. We're, we're still on the video, I'm... Sarah McMath. Are you really? That's not good. Well, we're only, um, seeing, we're only seeing the, we're, it's not running the video, we're just seeing the slide. Okay, so I think I've got network, we thought this might be an issue. Um, apologies, Charlotte, let's go to plan B. Can you share the slides from your computer? Yes. And uh, to save bandwidth. Uh, yeah, my computer has gone slow. I can't see how I can make the presenter. It won't let me do that. Oh, no. Uh, can you just tell me how I make your presenter? It won't. Um, I If I go to clicking on screen, it doesn't. Yeah, Charlotte um, should be a presenter now. Good. Thank you, Megan. Apologies, everyone, for that. I'm also going to turn off my camera to try and preserve my bandwidth. That's good. Yep, now we can see it. Um, to Charlotte, do you want to sit down to the subgroup slide? And Keris, thank you for um, picking up that, uh, that comment, uh, making me aware of it. Can you see my screen? So... Yeah, we can see your screen and if you go on to the next slide. So I was just talking about this slide, which is where we've got the four subgroups on technology, wastewater, wash service affordability, and then we've got a new group that's been formed this week around communications. Uh, and it's got, I don't know, half a dozen to a dozen people on it at the moment, but it'll gradually grow, I'm sure. Um, what we've also got here is where I should um, check out Megan Ford and Charlotte, as you've just seen, just perfectly demonstrated here is that Charlotte is the uh, has been the the backbone in terms of making sure that these webinars run smoothly and I'm delighted to share with you that Charlotte will be uh, going back to her home country of France and will be taking on a role with Veolia and we wish her the very best in doing that but it means that Megan will um, uh, step into the role so going forward it'll be Megan Ford who will be um, our point of contact um, as we now come to each of the subgroups, uh, I'm going to pick up during this, the next few minutes, the key moments, uh, the key themes from the last week. But actually, uh, I'd like to just take a few seconds for each of the subgroups to share what they've covered. So on the wastewater group, not surprisingly, it's been coming back to the age old concern of uh, is sewage infectious, which I think we're all acutely aware that there's now a lot of evidence to suggest that it isn't. Um, and then also the issue around could we use uh, the RNA from the virus as an early warning system uh, for monitoring. Uh, and you, that's been the main thread of the discussions in the wastewater group. Move to the next slide. Um, on the technology group, um, Charlotte, just could, uh, it looks like maybe your computer's uh, also frozen, or maybe my computer's frozen with the picture. Um, uh, on the wastewater yeah, it's okay. On the technology group, um, we've got uh, discussions have really been around the testing methodologies, uh, the experience of testing technologies in the field, and looking specifically at technologies that are at prototype stage. It's around making sure that we don't spend too much time looking at very early stage technologies. Um, and there's also the technology scan uh, project, which uh, has expanded in scope, and we've still got people joining, and so you're welcome to join that. On the wash services affordability group, um, this is all around obviously developing countries and emerging countries and how best we can support those. And perhaps not surprisingly, this, the focus has been around the socioeconomic impacts of, of water sanitation and hygiene or wash as it's referred to. As you can see on the right hand side, there has been a, a global call for action from sanitation and water for all, um, which is around asking the world leaders to uh, to think about wash, water sanitation and hygiene services and ensuring that they're delivered without discrimination. I'm going to touch a little bit on that uh, a bit further uh, into this presentation. So if we then come to uh, the agenda for the next, uh, next few minutes, um, wh what we're going to talk about is uh, these, this list of topics, but I'm going to focus specifically on water safety plans, um, the use of wastewater uh, RNA for monitoring, um, uh, to predict the infection, 
And I'm also going to touch on the water shutoffs and the moratoriums around that, the pros and cons. I should also say that at the end of this um, update on the week's activities, we've got a, a, an interview with um, KWR. So uh, Jan Vreberg uh, from KWR, and he will talk us through specifically some of the work they've been doing um, uh, around monitoring wastewater uh, samples for predicting the, the outbreaks. So we're going to start with looking at the exiting lockdown uh, and a case study from Mexico. Um, and there's some excellent data that's been shared here um, around what Mexico is doing as they exit the lockdown. And not surprisingly, it's got three very clear phases. And, and in the phases, there's then a, a traffic light system of red, amber, uh, yellow, and green. And uh, you can see here that the red is only essential activities coming all the way down to green, where that's when um, uh, schools finally reopen. And what's interesting is that we've done, taken a totally different approach here in the UK, for example, where actually one of the first things politicians are talking about uh, trying to mobilise is children back into school, um, which, uh, bearing in mind the impossibility of trying to keep five-year-olds social distancing, um, feels like a uh, a strategy that might might have warranted further thinking through. Um, uh, Sarah, who shared this information, also made the point, as you can see at the very bottom, that this strategy has been based on official stats around um, around infective cases in Mexico, but actually it excludes people who are in private hospitals or it excludes samples that are taken from private laboratories. And there's even the case that um, that some COVID-19 deaths aren't being reported as COVID-19, they're being reported as a sort of um, atypical pneumonia, which m might lead to poor decisions being made. But it's an interesting case study and one that I'm sure we can all um, learn from. So now if we come to the first of the sort of meaty topics to cover. It's on uh, water safety plans uh, in uh, uh, water safety plans. And I'd like to start by referring to this piece of work that was shared by Tony Kelly in Australia. And it basically referred to a scenario planning exercise that was done just before Christmas. And it was looking at a pandemic. It was actually looking at a much worse pandemic than COVID-19. They were looking at something like smallpox, something that had a much higher uh, infective rate and a much higher kill rate. And it, it followed exactly the scenario that we've seen here. So it shows that scenario planning was good. Um, and what it showed was that um, one of the first problems they incurred in the scenario planning was the, uh, the challenges with, with the supply of chlorine. And that then having a knock-on effect to um, a sort of second tier effect around waterborne diseases that would come on top of the pandemic because we couldn't supply chlorine. And the recommendation here is that actually when we come out of this current situation and we're thinking about our water safety plans, we need to be planning for something that's worse than what we currently experience because actually, in the world of, uh, of viruses, viral pandemics, this is probably a relatively gentle one. We now move on to the next slide, which is some experiences from the Italians. And I mentioned this last week. Uh, I said that uh, um, in Italy, uh, they experienced the pandemic probably four weeks, four to six weeks ahead of, of many other countries. And therefore, their thinking is a little bit further advanced. And they're already doing risk analysis in their water safety plans um, that incorporate pandemic issues. And uh, Aqua Bressian um, uh, have uh, had, had shared, have built their, their plan. It's based on these, um, these guidelines from the Italian National Institute of Health. And last week I said, yeah, it will be helpful. We'll translate them and, and share a summary. And that's what's on this slide and the next slide. And broadly, the headline I'd like you to take from this is that in drinking water, well, based on all the information we know at the moment, water is safe for human consumption. Uh, there is no great risk of transmission of COVID-19. Where the risk comes is it comes from indirect um, uh, issues that link to the pandemic emergency response and lockdown. In particular, the fact that we see increased local water consumption, in particular on the domestic side, and what that does if you're in a, as they are in Italy, in a drought situation. Flicking to the next slide, you'll see that on, uh, on the wastewater side, again, it's confirming very like on the drinking water side that current purification practices are very effective in activating the virus. Um, but that what we now need to think about is the matrix of how all the critical issues um, interact. And we've actually shared uh, on the OneDrive 
uh, the matrix there. It's been translated so that you can you can access it and, and lean upon it if you need to. Now, whereas this week, uh, after this main webinar, we're going to be doing an interview with KWR to talk about the, um, the sewage monitoring, next week, um, uh, Aqua Bressian have agreed that they will do a similar interview um, for uh, uh, talking through their water safety plans, the approach they took with those. So hopefully that will again pr provide some practical experience for you. If you can flick to the next slide now, um, Charlotte. Um, uh, and uh, so we'll, if you've got any specific questions you'd like me to frame to them, uh, let me have them and we'll make sure that we can extract as much value as possible uh, in next week's interview. And we've also included on this slide some go-to resources uh, around more safety plans because I know that this is a hot topic for many of you as we as we we come hope in many countries out of the lockdown and start thinking about well, what does this mean for us now we're getting back to some sort of normality um, how do we build that into our plans the next topic to talk about is uh, is the one that's been running solidly for nine weeks now which is around can we predict and monitor the infection rates by looking at, uh, at the, um, the viral load inside sewage? Um, in particular, looking at the uh, inactive, must stress it's the inactive RNA part of the, the virus. And what I've done here is I've, I've basically summarized the, the, the work that's going on in Sweden, France, the UAE, and North America. And what you can see is there's lots of people doing very similar work. Um, lots of, uh, of detailed programs where people are taking samples, analyzing them, and seeing how they match with the, the local outbreaks. And we're beginning to see the trends happening. We're, we're seeing that the, the uh, measurements of RNA increase just before the uh, number of people suffering um, uh, increases. And that links to what we presented a couple of weeks ago, which is that um, you know, we, we can start recording the RNA in people's sewage about three days after they're infected, which is about 10 days before they um, fall ill. So we've got this ability, hopefully, to be able to track the disease. Now, what I want you to take from this slide is that there's lots of, that there isn't, this isn't a piece of work that's being done in one area. It's work that's being done in lots of areas. Now, there's two ways you could look at that. One is to say, why oh, isn't it all coordinated and all done in one place? Um, or you can take uh, what I think is the more appropriate answer, which is it's actually glorious that there's all these different teams working on it because it enables us to test out different methodologies. It enables us to make sure that we're, we're, we will find the right way forward. Now, what's got to happen, of course, is it's got to be the shared learning. People have got to share their different methodologies so that we can then compare data from different regions in a sensible way. There is also the beauty here of by doing it around the world, we'll see some seasonality effects because, of course, they're going into winter in Australia, whereas we're going into summer in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. And, and by looking at the data that's coming from those two areas, we'll hopefully get a sense of, well, what are the other temperature effects mean for, for this uh, infection rate? Go to the next slide. So that's on some of the work that's being done around monitoring the infective load. There's also been a lot of work based on the uh, epidemiology and what's happening where. And the same story applies here. There's lots of very clever people um, putting their brain power into into refining the, the sampling processes and the protocols and the analytical methods. Be that in the United States with the, the Water Research Foundation or Australia with the Colossus Project or Europe with the Sewers for COVID um, project and, the, and various uh, other studies that are going on. I do particularly like the fact that on this slide, we separated out U UK from Europe. And I, I think back only six months ago when Brexit seemed to be the only thing that we talk about. And here, of course, we see it before our eyes, the UK is no longer part of Europe. And I, I hate Brexit. I wish we'd never left. But, um, but it's funny that I now long for the days when that was the thing that, that we focused our minds on. Um, if we go to the next slide, this shows, I just couldn't fit it all on one slide, this shows the South Africa bit, again, it's the same thing, they're doing very similar work, they're tracking and monitoring the presence of, of SARS-CoV-2 virus in sewage and looking to develop up a system. And I thought, well, what's useful that I can share on this webinar? So if we go to the next slide, where I think what's useful is, is, is we need to sort of check in our brains, um, what do we know so far and what don't we know? So if you can just flick to the next slide, maybe the system's catching up. Um, um, and you can see that basically here's a good summary. What we know 
is we know that there is no live or active SARS-CoV virus in the raw wastewater. We know that it's the RNA fragments that are there. We know that they, they gather up in the sludge biosolids. We know that the risk assessments we use for operators on sewage, sewage works are, are safe and reliable. What we don't know is the concentration of the virus that's in the wastewater and its variability. We don't know the, the dose response relationship there. I think there's also some questions around, we don't yet know how we're going to interpret the data and deliver that into a, um, into a cogent systematic way of having an early warning system. And I suspect, uh, and uh, Jan, I'm sure we'll touch on this when we do the interview with him <clears throat> in a few minutes time, but I suspect that that's where uh, the real benefit comes from this sort of early warning system, which will probably be uh, more all-encompassing and more reliable than, than uh, a contact tracing app, which is what uh, most people are looking at at the moment. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and that's the bit, only bit I wanted to sort of share around uh, monitoring for sewage. I'd now like to move on to thinking about wash and vulnerable communities, washes, water and sanitation and hygiene. and there's lots of very worthy organizations focusing their attention on this from the IWA to the World Bank to um, the Sanitation and Water for All. And the messages are, are common to all of them, are that, that wash practices are the foundation of an effective response to the virus. We have to supply clean water to people wherever they are in the world uh, and whatever their, their sort of personal circumstances and that, that WASH basically has to be put higher on the political agenda. Those seem to be the sort of broad messages that are being driven home. Where I thought it would be useful in this webinar wasn't to repeat those messages, because I think we probably all uh, understand and recognize them. So if we can go to the next slide. Where I thought would be useful would be to, to talk about, to just try and shine a little bit of light on what happens in slums, um, what happens in those uh, peri-urban environments which are, are do not have the structure that we are, we are used to having in those of us who live in the, in the developed world. And I've got here under the key learnings, you can see the, the first issue that comes out to play is that there isn't spatial and mapping information. You can't, if you've got an informal settlement where people have just built a shanty town around a, a water pump and it's just expanded and expanded, slums are not homogeneous. And, and you've got different areas which are more risk prone than others that, that need to be thought through. You've also got an issue with the utilities that serve those areas are, are in even deeper trouble than what we've, we're experiencing in the developed countries. So you can see here, Emma Cesar in, uh, in Spain, uh, they, they've noted a 90% immediate reduction in the revenues that they got to, to, when they're supplying it to vulnerable populations. Uh, down at the bottom, that bottom bullet point around Kingston, Jamaica, um, there you can see there's the organization talking about how only two or three months ago they were terribly proud that they were a commercial organization that was thinking through how they, um, how they could operate as a commercial, sustainable, financially sustainable entity. And overnight they've had to become a humanitarian organization uh, just trying to, to provide support to the, the populations that they serve. There's also issues buried in here around how slums, uh, that's right, don't, don't go back, you can stay uh, where you are, um, how slums um, are supporting different parts of, uh, uh, they, they've built their own informal water networks and services with crisis teams being mobilized to ensure the importance of hygiene in particular, was seen from Buenos Aires in Argentina. There's another slide after this, which now covers a few other points around WASH, which if you're interested in this particular area, I encourage you to join the WASH subgroup in the interest of time. I'm not going to talk through these and we'll jump straight onto the, onto the next slide. Um, but there's some detail there that you might want to refer to at a later time. I'd now like to talk about water shutoff moratoriums and the pros and cons of those. Now, a blue paper was issued by the Center for Water Security and Cooperation in the United States. And it talked about the shortcomings of COVID-19 water shutoff moratoriums. And there's a direct quote here that says, 13 states, including the District of Columbia, adopted statewide moratoriums prohibiting public and investor-owned utilities from shutting off water during the pandemic. While this prohibition takes a direct critical step, is a, direct, is a critical step in ensuring access to water, um, it falls short of providing access uh, for water for all. 
Now, of course, you'd expect that to be the response from the Center for Water Security and Cooperation, but it does highlight some really useful points. And there, there's a full paper you can go to, but a little summary of it we've put here, which is basically they're saying there are certain responses which really should be prepared in advance to a pandemic. And they should include that we that shutting off water to customers will be prohibited during a public emergency and that water services will be restored to those homes which had already been disconnected. Um, and that the cost of water during an emergency should not immediately become due and late fees shouldn't be accruing and there shouldn't be a charge for reconnection. So it's quite a bold statement around, you know, when we're in these sorts of public health emergencies, we need to support yeah. people. Yes. Now, if you then go to the next slide, there is, of course, like with all of these things, there's another angle to this which needs to be thought about. And I've just highlighted here from Colombia, uh, USA and, um, and Mexico, um, three sort of perspectives that have been shared because we've seen both of these coming through in this last week. So Colombia was one of the first utilities, first countries that obliged utilities to reconnect users that didn't pay. And they've had something like 200,000 have been reconnected. Now, what's really interesting in Colombia is we started to see... Um, We've got sorry, can we just, um, Megan, shall, any chance you could mute um, uh, someone's yeah. talking? Yeah. True. Yeah, I know it's a challenge finding out who they are. If you're not on mute, can I just politely ask that you put yourself on mute? Um, uh, so Colombia was one of the first countries to um, uh, encourage people to put themselves... Um, uh, or equally, if it's pissing down, it might be just nice to have a change of scene. Hi, Tom Williams. Can you hear us, Tom Williams? Could we put you on mute, please? Um, so, uh, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so we've now got uh, a situation in Colombia, in particular, where uh, they are recovering less than 30% of their normal income. And the key thing here is that some of their customers aren't paying because they can't pay, but some of the customers aren't paying because they can pay, but now don't feel they have to. And you've now got this really interesting social problem that's occurring where people fall into three categories. I can pay my bill and I'm going to, I can pay my bill, but I'm not going to, or I can't pay my bill and thank you very much for, for not forcing me to. And it's that, that middle group that creates a particular challenge. In the United States, we've also got an issue here with um, uh, it being flagged up that, that uh, we're expecting there to be a hit to water utilities across the United States of around $40 billion. Um, and there's obviously the HEROES Act going through Congress at the moment, but that money probably won't cover that, that gap. And uh, Pete Santa Stamos from the Office of Sustainable Water Solutions flagged the point that actually um, this is going to hit particularly hard those small utilities and those utilities that are serving low-income communities. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, we're now coming to the, the end of the highlights bits here, and I, I'll just pick off two things here, not specifically around water, but they're really interesting that were shared. So one is in uh, Senegal, the testing of a cheap, rapid um, COVID-19 testing kit, you know, less than a dollar, gives you a result within 10 minutes, works very like a pregnancy test kit, you know, with a bloodline appearing on a piece of, uh, uh, a piece of um, on the monitor. And the bottom one from the United States, Harvard and MIT researchers developing a face mask that will light up when it detects the coronavirus. I just love this idea. I love this idea that we're going to be on, on metro trains and tube trains and someone will sneeze and their mask will light up. You can imagine the panic as everybody tries to get away from them. I shouldn't laugh. Um, it's a glorious bit of technology and will be um, really interesting to see if it, uh, uh, if it can be developed. Come to the last slide on this one, which is a section um, that linked not specifically to COVID-19, but it does link to one of the sort of fallout areas from COVID-19, which is around water consumption. And it was raised by uh, one of our colleagues in Mexico, who, um, who basically said, you know, what can we do to encourage customers to use less water? And there were some great suggestions made, which in the interest of time, I won't repeat, but they're, they're available here if you're, if you're interested to see them. So um, moving on. Um, as always, we finish this presentation with the links to the shared resources and some of the things you might want to, to look at. There's the daily, daily go-to blog and some events and a video there. Um, and on the next slide, you've got more references you could go to. And then if we go to the next slide again, um, that we've actually produced in aisle uh, a document that summarizes the, the key threads that we've seen in this, uh, this 
uh, these webinars over the last um, two months. So we've actually got a document, if you were minded to it, uh, to, to have a summary document that, that shares what's happened in those. If you'd like a copy of that, just drop me an email and I will uh, ping it straight back to you. Um, so to summarize this part of the uh, agenda, um, if you're interested in any of the above topics or you want to invite your colleagues onto any of the subgroups, please contact Megan Ford, not Charlotte, because Charlotte will not be with us this time next week. Uh, and if you want to drop Charlotte a little email to thank her, then I'm sure she'd be delighted. Um, if you'd like to consider things uh, this week, it's which subgroups would you like to join? Note that next week we'll be interviewing Acro uh, about their water safety plans. And then I'll also just give a tiny shout out to a water action platform. So we're looking at ways to move this forum into something which will be longer lasting and a bit more detailed. Uh, it will be free at the point of use. Um, so we're, we're trying to find a way of making this platform available uh, to everybody and to be longer lasting than just covering the COVID-19 area. Um, we're looking to find some sponsors for that and if you're interested let me know and we can we can get in a conversation now with that uh, i'm going to pause at that stage and um we if i could just ask uh, jan vreberg uh, hopefully jan are you there can you put yourself uh, off mute and can you also yes, turn on um, your camera yes i'm here Piers. so i hope you can see me now Come on, uh, we can. Um, uh, Charlotte, I think actually if you stop sharing your screen, what that will enable is it means that uh, uh, Jan and my uh, faces will hopefully appear on the screen mostly. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, Jan works for KWR and I guess let's, let's jump straight into it because we lost a few minutes there because uh, of the technical challenges at the beginning for which I truly am sorry Jan, I do apologise. Um, no problem. But, uh, if, um, so let's start. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Piers, for having me here on this, uh, on this podium. Um, well, to concentrate on me, I work for over 33 years now uh, in, the, uh, in the water industry. Most of that I've worked uh, with uh, KWR, but also with a few water companies. And during my time at KWR, I also had some uh, affiliations with uh, universities. Uh, the Technical University in Delft and the Wageningen University. So I'm always be, I always have been between the research and the uh, and the practice, if you like. Uh, well, nicely celebrating the the motto of KWR, bridging science to practice, uh, if you like. Uh, and it was really exciting to work uh, always in the forefront of this uh, of the research on various water issues and sewer issues, etc. So. Great. And, and for people who don't know anything about KWR, can you give me the, I, we obviously want to get into the detail about what you've been doing in wastewater uh, monitoring, but again, just at the high, high level, can you just introduce KWR? Yeah, um, KWR is a not-for-profit research institute and our share, well, it's privately operated, but our shareholders are the, uh, the Dutch water companies and also a Belgium uh, water companies. And the predecessor of, K of KWR, which is Kiwa, that was uh, founded in 1948, just after the Second World War, and was aiming at quality control, at uh, making good processes, etc., certification and uh, standardization mostly. And it was founded by the 200 water companies that were at that time present. And the main goal was collaboration, collaboration for better quality, for better uh, water processes, et cetera. Well, and almost inevitably that also includes research. And from 1976 onwards, we have this joint research program of which, well, many beautiful results have been, uh, are coming from. And we're also at the heart of uh, the GWRC, uh, the Water Share, Water Europe, et cetera. So we have a lot of spin-off in uh, our products, our knowledge to be applied in, uh, in practice, uh, you could say. Good. Uh, now, okay, so that's good. We get it. You're a not-for-profit research institute based out of the Netherlands, but you're doing stuff internationally and you've got a very broad remit. Um, now can we talk through, um, share with us what you've been doing? Because uh, we had the joy of, I think it was on the second of these webinars, uh, that was the first mention of, of the Dutch have been monitoring the virus in sewage and they, they've seen that there's a link and there was this, this sort of flurry of, 
of excitement that excitement and fear you know did this suddenly mean that sewage was contagious uh, and we we quickly learned that it wasn't but it, it felt like you were leading that work and yeah. can you just talk us through where it started and where you've got to now yeah well, if you really look to the start, and actually you have to go uh, 10 years back, uh, we were already then uh, starting to get involved in the wastewater-based epidemiology of, uh, for instance, the uh, drugs of abuse or illicit drugs. So we were looking at the, the, the rests of uh, these drugs into the, uh, in the sewer water to monitor, well, the, the health, but also the effect of measures. And it's very difficult in a uh, complex matrix as the uh, sewer water is to just find that one specific element that you're looking for. Well, this experience we used uh, because we hypothesized that the virus, or at least parts of the virus, would be uh, present in the stool of people and thus in the, um, uh, in the wastewater. And we could use these techniques to extract the, uh, the RNA from the uh, from the samples and multiply it and actually see if it was present or not and we started that in january 2020 just at the beginning of the whole pandemic and uh, the early samples that we took in the uh, beginning of february actually showed negative results so the virus wasn't uh, present at that time in the samples that we took but even before the first official diagnosis was made of covid 19 in the netherlands we already found traces of the virus uh, in, the, uh, in the, the sewer water. So actually indicating that what we had learned earlier in the, uh, the drug research also applies to this, uh, to this virus. So we can actually have, uh, we, we, can, we can see it, so we could use it as an early warning system because we found it prior to the, the actual uh, COVID-19 cases. Yeah. And uh, well, that, and that was very promising. So, so can we just take a couple of minutes just to talk about that early warning? So, yeah. um, because I think this is something that I suspect many people are interested in. It's the timing of how long that early warning gives us. If we say it takes two weeks from someone catching it to them exhibiting the symptoms and becoming ill, how mm -hmm. quickly can we get the data? Is it one day, two days, eight days, 12 yeah. days? How quickly can we realistically get the data and how much, how much early warning might it give us? Yeah, well, if you're looking now from the, the whole process, the logistics and the analysis itself, from taking the sample to the actual result, it takes one to two days. Um, we see that the, uh, the uh, excretion of the virus uh, through the stool after infection starts almost immediately, while the clinical symptoms start much later. And yeah. the, well, we don't know exactly what the period, so the incubation period is, period is but it's about well let's say it's about 10 to 12 days then within one or two days we are already able to well to see if it's there so we we gain about well let's say six to eight d eight, eight days uh, before it becomes clinically apparent that we can already see that there is a uh, an existence of the virus in the uh, in the sewer water which yeah, and let me just push that beliefs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, that's brilliant. You know, eight to ten days. We've got a lot of lot of public health protection we could do there. But let me just drill into that two days because mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that split down into taking a composite sample uh, and then gathering that sample and collecting it and moving it to the laboratory and then prepping it at the laboratory and then doing the laboratory analysis. And is that two days for that whole cycle or is it for part of that cycle? No, that's for the complete cycle, so in, including the, the logistics of taking the sample, transporting to the laboratory, etc. The actual analysis itself takes a few hours. So you have to prepare the sample, you have to extract it, and then you can do the QP, QCT PCR, well, uh, difficult yeah. word. And then you can, uh, you can, act, you can actually have the, uh, uh, the results. So the actual, the actual analysis is much shorter than these two days, but realistically, between the sample and the outcome, you have to take one to two days. Uh, and you can accelerate yep. that by, well, uh, streamlining the logistics, I would say. Yeah, and that then leads to a different question, which is, do you think there's ever the possibility that we might have um, real-time uh, sensors in the, in the sewer network, or is that a impracticality? Can we make the current system work effectively? Do we need to be inventing something that's a real-time sensor that would be sitting out in the network 
Um, do you think? Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you ask my personal meaning, then I don't think that's realistic, uh, that you can actually have such a sensor. But I'm not a specialist on that, and maybe it's possible. But on the other way, do you need a online sensor, uh, and is it or, or is it enough to have this almost near time, near uh, real time yeah. sampling with the one or two days? And actually, if you look at the time scale of the whole process, the incubation of two weeks, well, you could debate whether you should put your energy now in perfecting or standardizing the the actual sampling now, or put it into a uh, well the, this online online sensor and. I don't say that you don't that you shouldn't do that because I can see if you have well a lot of things happen from uh, um, old people like me saying it's not possible and then it turns out to be possible so don't believe me in this but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all right the, the world the history is scattered with people who say that's not possible but I think your point is well made that let's not yeah. let's not focus resources on trying to crack. Um, crack that particular problem when we've probably got bigger problems to focus on yeah. right now. Of course, there might be an issue that for a future pandemic, it might be with a, uh, a virus that doesn't take two weeks, it only takes three days. But that's, a, that's an issue that, that we'll yeah. think about yeah. a different time. Can, can I now move you to talking through, the, um, talking through the different methodologies? How variable do you think, I've, I've mentioned earlier that we've got all these different um, very clever people around the world focusing their brains on this and and I take I sleep easy at night knowing that there are people like you thinking about these problems and um, protecting us I'm so thankful for you and your organization and people like you who do this but how worried should we be that there might be different methodologies and different data being compared and contrasted that shouldn't be yeah well, if you ask me uh, my nightmares, then it would be that there are 10 different uh, types of, uh, of analyses that are fighting on who's the, who has the best uh, data. And that if we could prevent that and have a shared protocol, a shared analysis methodology, that would be great. And that the, the data, well, from scientific point of view, the, 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 the core is that you have reliable, reproducible data. So that would be the uh, the first thing that we have to do is to have this reliable, reproducible data, and then combine that with the clinical yeah. data to have an actual monitoring or early warning system. But the uh, I hope that we uh, that we can collaborate and and make this uh, universal protocol. And we also we already published what we have done, so you can find that back in in literature and and, and try to copy that or. Well, we can, we are obviously we are willing uh, to to collaborate on that to to make this methodology a well worldwide standard or whatever uh, ambition we would would have with that. But this whole system, uh, this whole early warning system, monitoring system, starts with the data that we gather from the samples. Yeah, so that's the yeah, that's it's, the uh, core. Got it. So um, in a minute, I'm going to invite anyone uh, to share questions. We have actually got one from George, which I'll, I'll share with in a minute. And I've got one more that I'd particularly like to ask. But just in case, if you're there, if you're, at, if you're online, just put it in the chat and I'll, I'll represent that question. Uh, and if you're not, um, then, then we'll let you take yourself off mute and, and interrupt. But let's do George's question here. He's asked, so George Ponton from Scottish Water. Hello, George, great to have you here. Um, He's asked, does the analysis determine the level of, in a, of, um, of infectivity uh, in the community or just that it exists? Is it binary or does it actually give us a, a scale? If you see a high concentration of the RNA, um, can we reasonably assume that that means there's a lot of people there? And can we quantify it? I think it's the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand the question. And that's exactly the, the development that we're, that we're looking for. We now are able to, uh, to, uh, to show that the virus is there. The second uh, step is to combine that with clinical data and have a time series of samples in the same area connecting with the clinical data. Have a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning and all the uh, the techniques that you have to make these analyses, to make it an actual quant quantitative uh, results. So you can see that, for instance, a measure really results in a decrease of the infection rate or a loosing up uh, results yeah. again in an increase to a certain level. So that's really a monitoring and dashboard that you can that you can look for. But at the moment, now, uh, it's, it's, we're not there yet, I'm afraid. Yeah, I said that I'd only got, I got one more question. Actually, I've got two if you don't, if you'll forgive me. So I made a comment earlier about how I, I think that if we could make this work, um, this would be more effective, faster, 
uh, and more effective and more rapid than the contact tracing apps that people are talking about on phones because we would spot it before people have got infected. Um, is, is that me wishfully thinking or is that also supported by you, someone who actually knows what they're talking about? <laughs> I think it's, it's, re it's really realistic to, uh, to, to have this. So you can, you can uh, um, if we are just further developing it to a really quantitative tool, and I think that's, that's really feasible uh, doing that within the couple, next couple of weeks or months, uh, then you can then you can actually well replace this no not replace but uh, use this also as a, as an indication uh, for the spread of the yeah. virus or the spread of the COVID-19 and uh, the finer you can make the mesh of sampling the finer you can pinpoint to uh, to centers of uh, of infection or to to centers of uh, uh, yeah to centers of infection. And actually, that will be the point. Now, we the, the sampling and the, the analysis takes, well, it, it's an effort. Eh? It takes some time. You need capacity. It's also yeah. competing with the clinical data testing, actually. Uh, the, you have the, yeah. same, uh, the same materials you need for that. But yeah, I can, I can really see this as a, uh, as a, not a replacement for clinical data, but actually a, well, really a, a tool to monitor. And maybe in the discussion of what you, you already have, it could be an argument to have a sewage system instead of this. Yeah, absolutely. This first so, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, my question to you is, uh, so it's great what you're doing. All of this work is brilliant. Um, what, if anything, do you need from this audience? Here you've got um, a platform which is involving hundreds of water utilities uh, around the world. Uh, lots of, uh, of technical people enthusiastic to exercise their, uh, their capability and resources to, to address this problem. What would your ask be to this, this community? Is it about data sharing? Is it about more samples? Is it, what, what would you want from them? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I want the world, you could say, but basically what I want is uh, uh, collaboration and of course also funding for uh, making the protocol shared by everybody, making it used by, by everybody and then combining it with data. So collaboration, of course also funding, but collaboration to further develop this into a quantitative tool, meaning that you have the ability or you can engage the ability to do the sampling and the analysis, that you have the uh, connection with the upper world, the clinical data, etc., that we can actually make uh, progress on developing this uh, this monitoring tool next to the early warning uh, system. Uh, so I will be open for any conversation, for any uh, invitation to 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 speak about that. Uh, Excellent. So what I'm going to do. Uh, so this morning, uh, Dragan, the uh, the chief executive of KWR, did a very similar interview as you probably know on this morning's webinar. And when I circulate the slides in a few minutes' time. I'm going to include both yours and Dragon's emails and encourage people to connect with you directly because I'm sure there'll be, be some yeah. follow up there. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I'm aware we, we slot this, this conference for three quarters of an hour. So I will at this stage um, thank everybody and let you drop off if you want to go. Um, if you want to stay, uh, Jan, are you okay staying online for another few minutes while we pick off some yeah, of the questions okay. that have come up? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, so. Um, if I can, uh, where I want to be conscious and respectful to people's time. So if you've joined the conference and you found this interesting, but you do now need to move on with other parts of your, uh, of your day, can I thank you for your, your input? Uh, wish you a health and happy and safe week and uh, hopefully see you next week. If you want to stay on, um, we will take a few more minutes to pick up some of these questions, but thank you very much. So, um, Here's where we, we see the numbers collapse. Um, uh, but that's okay. um, so there's a few questions here. Uh, I'm going to start, go back to George. Um, so George, uh, well, actually, George, as the numbers are dropping, if you're there and you want to stay, I'll let you come off mute and you can ask the question directly because you've got a couple here. Uh, and Joe, I'll do the same with you. Um, George, do you want to, to articulate it or shall I say it? Yeah, yeah no, no, it's fine. It was just, it was a kind of a follow up from um, Pierre's question on. Um, using this instead of contact tracing and it was just whether this would ever get to the level of granularity that you you take account of the proximity of people to one another but i suppose the other aspect of that is how do you how do you take account of transient population versus local population 
particularly if people start going back to commuting into cities and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I want to make clear is that's not a, a replacement of the uh, the clinical tracing and the contact tracing, etc. It's purely a monitoring tool. And um, if you can make a time series of the of the results, for instance, uh, you have the the peak of the uh, of the infection or the peak of the COVID-19, and you can see that decreasing. You can also see decreasing in infect, infection levels. And if you loosen loosen uh, measures again, you can see it rise probably again. And you can well, you can you can try to what level you 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 can go. And of course, if you increase contacts in a community, then you will also increase the infection rate. That's inevitable. But is it increasing to an acceptable level uh, that you can take, uh, that you can digest within your healthcare system or within the uh, uh, in, in relation to the economic uh, uh, economic value of this loosening of material of, uh, of measures? It's it's purely a monitoring system and not a replacement for the uh, for the clinical assessment of uh, of data and for the clinical assessment of the contact data if you can have a smaller mesh of um, of sampling then you can of course also well uh, more in more detail saying that in that community or in that city or in that village uh, it's it's spreading uh, the spreading is larger than in other cities. So what's the difference? So what, it, it, it opens a lot of windows for, for research and analysis to see what are effective methods as well. So yeah, I can see a, well, a very broad application of this, uh, which really excites me, uh, I must say. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And um, Joe, you had a question there. Can I, John, take yourself off mute and ask it? Joe Burgess yep. from South Africa. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, a couple of questions, and forgive me if these are, are not very sensible questions, but are we able to um, discern a relationship between the amount of viral shedding or the, the quantity of RNA load in wastewater and the R0 or the, the infectivity rate, if that's the right word, yeah. um, of the virus? Or not um, yet? Well, I don't think that we're there yet, but there are. Uh, we we've got some experience with the uh, with the drug abuse or the the medicine uh, parts of medicine that we analyze in the system, and there we also try to make relations between the uh, uh, the the amount of uh, metabolites that we find and the total population. And you can relate that. Well, maybe it's a bit technical, but you can relate that also to other substances people shed with their stool. So you can make the relation into that. So you know from the substances, substances for, for instance, phosphate or something, you know how much people it concerns. And then if you relate that to the amount of virus that you find, you can have this relation. But again, this is speculation. We do have a lot of experience in it with the, the other substances, and we can transfer that experience into these new modeling. And uh, But we're not there yet, but I hope to be there in, well, in due time. Uh, I have to look at uh, Gertjan Medema also, maybe you know him as well. He's our, uh, well, nerd, I wouldn't say that, but he's our specialist on all these cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how to alienate your work colleagues. Um, yes, exactly. Brilliant. All right, we've got two more questions, which I would like to cover before we let you go. Um, so one is from JT. Uh, JT, are you there? Are you able to take yourself off mute? Otherwise, I will just record, read out your question. Uh, I'll read his question. So he's made the point here that um, this is all in the research phase. How close are we to allowing this technology to be used by a, a real water wastewater laboratory? And what, if we are close to it, what are the precautions that we need to be aware of with this testing? You know, what are the dangers, the potential dangers? Yeah. Um, actually, this technology can be uh, can be applied. We actually did it, so it's readily available. And the precautions that you have to take are not more specific than you take with uh, normal uh, analysis of wastewater, because it is a complicated substance with a lot of pathogenic load, etc. So you need to be cautious with that anyway. We also know that the uh, the virus RNA that we find is not an active virus, so there is no added danger or added uh, yeah added danger in in doing that. So the normal precautions that you take 
with the analysis of working with wastewater uh, in general, uh, also apply here. I don't think that you need extra precautions because, well, I said, the virus that we find or the RNA risks of virus that we find is not an infectious virus. Uh, so does that answer your question? Great. Right. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's a good question. Um, good answer, rather. Uh, and then finally, unless anyone else wants to throw a question out here. Um, uh, yes, JT has just come back on the line saying, yes, thank you. You, you, you did answer this question. We've got a question from Dan Frost, which I suspect is a really good question, which actually goes to the heart of the challenge we've got here. Dan, do you want to take yourself off mute and, uh, and phrase it? Sure. Thanks, Piers. I was wondering, you know, you mentioned that uh, you had a vision for sharing knowledge and methods and being able to combine data in the future to develop, you know, sound approaches. So is KWR advocating for certain sample collection, prep and analysis methods now that these various universities and research laboratories should be considering as they're collecting data um, so that, you know, these samples are being collected while the virus exists. But yeah. uh, once the virus, you know, passes, uh, you know, it's unclear if this data will be useful or not. Yeah. Um, well, we have published the, the work that we've done on this uh, on this uh, research uh, by uh, Gertjan Medema in this medical library. If you find Gertjan Medema and sewers, uh, sewer COVID-19, you will find it. Uh, in that paper, there is also, well, we can also share it through, uh, through peers, of course. Um, um, in this paper, you can find the way we prepped the samples and how we did it. And that, of course, is based on our experience that we I told you about that we had with uh, earlier uh, epidemiologic wastewater based uh, research. And yes, I would like to have um, from a scientific point of view that we have samples that are reproducible and that are reliable. So the outcomes are reproducible and reliable so we can actually share data. And uh, this is this is of so much importance that it is not. I don't think it's really wise to sit on data and to uh, not share it uh, because, well, the, the huge economic importance... Not for an issue like this. <laughs> this is Sorry? so important. We can't, we can't get this wrong. We can't afford to have people sitting on data and not sharing it. It's just be mad. Exactly. exactly. Um, thank you for that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I know that went on a little bit longer. I do apologize for um, my technical challenges earlier on. Um, uh, Dragon, Dragon he, already shared the paper in the uh, in the chat. Uh, oh, has he? Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, I, I saw that there's more things going on there. Right. Um, but I am going to thank you all for your time. I repeat what I said earlier. I I sleep easier at night knowing that there are people like you, Jan, uh, thinking about these problems and and trying to address them. And so, on behalf of of everybody on this call, I thank you for the work you're doing and, and please keep it up. Hopefully as work progresses, maybe you'll come back and share a further update in, in time. Um, yeah. With that, I wish you all um, a great week. I hope to uh, see you uh, again uh, next week. Um, keep safe, speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jan and Dragon.